Hi, I'm William Summers. And you're listening to Uncommon. This podcast is brought to you by Neural Media. Are you an entrepreneur or marketer who needs help making podcasts, video, or animation? Perhaps you don't have time to manage a freelancer or the budget to deal with an agency. Well, Neural Media can help you with simple and affordable content creation, saving you time and money by taking away the pain of producing that content. To learn more, head to neural.com slash media. That's N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E.com slash media. Play around with our pricing or request a callback directly. Listeners to the show receive a special discount by using the promo code UNCOMMON. Welcome to another episode of Uncommon. My name's Jordan Mike, ladies, and I'm your host. In this episode, I have for you William Summers. William is an independent researcher, journalist, and blogger who specializes in politics, public policy, and freedom of information. He's written for the likes of the ABC, Daily Telegraph, and Crikey, just to name a few. William was the first person to uncover Barnaby Joyce's dual citizenship issue, I guess you could call it, and kickstarted the Victorian Parliament expenses scandal in 2017. Freedom of information is a crucial component to free speech and the norms of our democracy. No matter your political persuasion, the general public should just always encourage the work of people like William, particularly as executive branches of government increasingly call for further benefits or power. In this episode, we covered the importance of a republic and pro-monarchy arguments, the ultimate political system, Australian v or versus UK politics, freedom of information and free speech, how they relate to each other, nepotism in Australian politics, as well as corruption and the current state of our media. If you enjoyed this episode, do leave us a rating on your podcast app. If you want to follow promos or upcoming episodes, behind the scenes stuff, check out Instagram. It's at uncommon underscore podcast. If you want to watch William and I talking over video, then have a look at Uncommon Neural on YouTube to do just that. Show notes and all previous guests can be found at neural.com slash podcast. But thank you so much for listening, regulars and newbies alike. I hope you all enjoy this conversation with William Summers. Will, we're yeah. live. <laughs> How are you? Yes, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh I had a few things I wanted to, to ask you to get started, um, and I'm always wary when we're down there in the kitchen preparing tea, water, whatnot, that I don't expose too much and ruin the conversation, but uh, the, f- the, the thing that was in my head when I was doing the research on you was, will the UK ever become a republic? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes, it will. Yeah. Uh, I don't know when. I wish I could tell you. Okay. Um, at the rate Australia is going, I wouldn't be surprised if it was before Australia. So. Yeah. Well, why do you think that is? I have been involved in the uh, Republic campaign in the UK for a long time. I've tried to get involved a bit in the Australian campaign. I My impressions are definitely that the UK campaign punches above its weight. Is It runs a good kind of grassroots campaign it gets members it has lots of member events it does kind of flyering in city centers and my uh, own view is that the australian campaign concentrates on going for lunch with politicians <laughs> and waiting for a government which is going to uh, have another referendum mm. um, the difficulty being that i don't think any government is really going to get behind it until there is a uh, a popular support for it And even though Labour say they're going to have a referendum, uh, if they get in government this time, uh, I suspect it's going to get hit by the same snags as last time. And as soon as the question gets raised of what kind of republic, it's going to fall apart fairly quickly. So I'm not particularly optimistic about Australia's chances of becoming a republic anytime soon, which is sad because I, I really do feel strongly and think they should do. But yeah, I, 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 in my opinion, I think the Australian campaign needs to be more grassroots and concentrate on getting the popular support behind it rather than getting politicians. Why, why it. is the, the idea of a republic important to you? I think it comes from my overall kind of philosophy, I guess, around 
uh, politics um, and life, which is that I just think that people are should be, it sounds a bit cheesy, but born equal, you know, it should be it's certainly born with the same opportunities. And the monarchy for me underpins the whole kind of class system in the UK. And it underpins the whole um, the whole feeling around uh, some people getting breaks and other people not. For example, you know we uh, you, we've had Meghan Markle, for example, joining the royal family and supposedly <laughs> modernising it. But you know it's still all generally has been kind of a, a white conservative family. One family need to be born into. Uh, having power through um, just the luck of birth is uh, pretty bad. Um, many people have kind of wealth and power through luck of birth, but, uh, through luck of where they're born and who they're born to. But it's kind of knotted right into the royal family. The whole point of the royal family is yeah. that it's one person is born and gets all this kind of power and privilege. And it just, to me, undermines, like, uh, uh, underlines rather uh, the whole kind of class system and, um, you, you know. Yeah, it, it's, it's a weird thing, but I've also seen some pretty good arguments f- for it like we had a guest um edward burke he's a bit of a character uh was dubbed the youngest trump super fan in australia there was these all all these vice articles about him and he's uh he's probably about 18 or 19 now but he was sort of running uh i guess running the campaign for donald trump in australia in some way but he 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 was a kid that was clearly thinking a bit higher than most at that age and you could argue maybe not so much for the support of Donald Trump but he had a point that while the monarchy is a classist system it is a useful system in that it sort of nullifies the head of state as sort of a benign power if that makes sense like the I think the way that he was saying it is because they just have to follow through with what I guess the norms are in the parliament or the governing branch of government uh, that it makes it a better system than, say, America, where you have these clashes that come from the power of the head of state and the governing branch, if that makes sense. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, why is it a good thing, is what I would say to him, (laughs) to have a a monarch that just goes along with everything that the government puts to it? You know, the the point of democracy is that there are, you know, we we have an elected government and in Australia we have an elected government. It is a democracy. It's flawed democracy, but it is a democracy. But I don't think it's a good thing to have this uh, power at the top of it that does just tick off uh, uh, laws and sign off things and kind of cut ribbons without any um, power, really, any real power. It does have theoretical power without any real power to kind of step in when things go wrong. So you look at, for example, in the UK with the whole kind of Brexit uh, debate going on and various kind of issues around, um, constitutional issues around the parliament and the votes for Brexit and how many times it can go backwards and forwards. Now, I'm not saying that the certainly the Queen should be stepping in, but if you had a, a, a democratically elected head of state, somebody who was, I guess, independent from the MPs, they should at least be able to show some kind of leadership for the country, at least be able to, for example, get the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in a room and say, you know, butt heads together and try and get them to come up with a solution and just show a bit of leadership. So, But for me, there's there's no downside to having a uh, a elected head of state. I would prefer a directly elected. Many other people I know would prefer a, an indirectly uh, chosen head of state. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of benefit and ultimately it's, it's democracy. What, what do you think is the ultimate political system that you've seen in practice in the world right now? Like if you had to pick one or two sovereign countries, what do you like the most? That's a tricky question. I mean, uh, look, I, you know, I, I, I <laughs> like us, Australian democracy is, is good. Uh, and I was tempted to say good enough, but, but it's not actually good enough because it is flawed. Mm. Um, now, Australia has the monarchy. If, if Australia, for me, if it got rid of the monarchy uh, and had a Australian head of state, I think that would be getting pretty good. Uh, but, you know, as as is well known, you know, democracy, uh, what's the phrase? Democracy is the 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 best. The best system. and worst thing? <laughs> no, I was going to say, what's the phrase? The um, 
anyway, I, f- I forget what the, the quote is. The, the best, <laughs> someone, the, the best of be... a bad bunch is essentially. Okay. Um, uh, someone will be saying that in the comments right now. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but look, democracy, if you know, if you believe in democracy, I think you've got to believe in people kind of choosing, you know, who they want to represent them. Um, and for me, you know, we do have a representative democracy in Australia. I just think we should go uh, one further. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, f- you know, flaws in democracy, but there's the flaws in every democracy. I mean, the American mm. model has, you know, huge flaws in it, but at least, you know, people get to choose who their president is. And, you know, there's no, I know they have problems with the hanging chads and other kind of democratic problems. But as far as I know, there's no real kind of uh, controversy over how people are elected in the UK, in the US. Yeah. I mean, I quite like the Swiss system. I like the more direct, the better. I want to be able to vote on mm. popular issues. And the Swiss, um, of course, don't have a head of state at all. No, they've got that sort of um, seven-person body. yeah, federal council. I yeah, think sort of like the yeah. Matrix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which yeah. I prefer because I think that to to have one person... Look, at the, both, there's pros and cons to everything, as you said before. Like, I think if you have one person, at least you know what you're going to get. There's clear understanding of what is the policy, what are they going to be doing for the next three four years. Whereas in this governing body, you've got a, a sort of a meeting of minds of cro- across the major parties in the country. So, you, yeah, I can see that's that would be one of the reasons why a lot of these major issues would be passed off to the electorate, mm. which I'm okay with because I think that you get a few more things done. You know, like uh, the clearest thing for me right now in Australia is energy policy. I don't think uh, coming up to this election that either party has really come out with a policy that I truly agree with that is firmly in the middle. Whereas I feel that if maybe there was uh, a more popular way of, of going about it or, or sort of that governing, what do you call it, council, that there would be a better policy that, that t- grabs everything from each different party or ideas. Although that's, I think, one of the problems with how we do democracy, not just in Australia, but in the UK, um, probably in the US as well, of one party basically becoming government or being perceived to be the government, and then they're the ones making all of the rules. Mm. So one of the things we're hearing in the election campaign quite a lot is around independence. Well, don't vote in de- independence because you know they'll destabilise government or all, and we'll have to negotiate with them. And my question is always, well, what's the, what's the problem with people? You know, yeah. every day in our lives, we negotiate with people, you know, and in work environments, uh, across many aspects of lives, you're kind of negotiating to find a solution that suits people. Yeah. Yet for government, for some reason, there seems to be a perception that a good thing is having people that can run rush run roughshod over everything and make up uh, every rule uh, without any kind of accountability. And I don't. It's not something that I have ever agreed with. I find it kind of a strange philosophy that it's good to have a strong government. You know that we're not Russia. You know we're not we're not looking for a kind of the strong man. Or we should, I don't think yeah. we should be. We should be looking for somewhere something. You've got independence. You've got uh, minor parties, for example. You know, come to a some kind of negotiation, and I know the system is not particularly well set up for that because then you get the you know the pork barreling. You know, yes, I'll support you, <laughs> but you know, build a bridge in you know Tasmania or whatever, um, which is not ideal. But uh, you know, if you have, I think more of a culture of that, and even more independence, I think you would you know soon get rid of that kind of thing because you could try and come up with a, a compromise and get people behind it. Yeah, I think in that instance as well, the people who who say that would be the same people that say they don't trust politicians which i Hmm. you know that's why i like having as many people involved as possible Hmm. um to put into that that conversation i guess now when you're growing up what did you think you were going to be when you were a kid when i was uh i don't know eight or something i remember uh writing books and I did start writing, and I, I had a, um, a a hero that I can't remember what his name was, Zeke or something, that kind of used to go around and do some wonderful adventures. Uh, and then my older brother liked the idea so much, he basically ripped the whole thing off, uh, changed the name of the main character slightly and made his own books, and it kind of put me off somewhat from this. So that's my early lesson in plagiarism uh, and somebody kind of spoiling the fun for me. Um, so I think early on I did want to be uh, a writer of some sort, um, 
funny enough, I was never that good at kind of you know English at school. I was, I never used to read a lot. I, I had, probably could count the number of books uh, on one hand that I'd read by the time I, I finished school. Because um, generally, I'd read you know what I'm sure lots of people do read the first couple of chapters and then go and watch the the movie. <laughs> um, so I, I was never a big reader, and it's really and that has been a you know a bit of a hindrance to me. I think um, ongoing. So yeah, I definitely think I had a bit of a writing bug. Uh, earlier on it kind of took me a bit of a, a longer time and a bit of a roundabout route to, to get back to it so if you don't like reading you prefer watching it seems well i do do the reading now um i'm, uh, I'm much okay. more reader I, I took up reading much more over the last uh probably kind of 10 years so i do read quite a lot of books now it's just i think i early on i i never really had that uh interest um, or experience of reading You grew up in an interesting era. We've actually had some friends. um, So, you grew up in Norfolk, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah. So, because we we had these friends and they recently just started a brewery in, uh, it's in Abbey Farm, Westacre in Mm -hmm. Norfolk. Do you know where that, that's not far from? I know of Westacre, yeah. I don't know of the the brewery, but next time I'm there, I shall go and pop in. Yeah, well, I mean, I've become in the last, I'd say six months, fascinated with Mm -hmm. that era simply because these friends have opened up uh, Mm -hmm opened up this this brewery um you know you you grew, i think you grew up around there you studied at the university of leicester right yeah that's right yeah you did economics i think from from looking at the uh the old linkedin profile you actually came out here for a job placement uh, a little bit more complicated than that so i emigrated to australia when i was 12 with my family so my uh-huh. whole family so i've got one of these uh overly complicated backgrounds when people often say to me you know or how long have you been in australia or you know when are you going home for example and i kind of always point out it's a bit more complicated than that um so when i was 12 my whole family moved over uh and we lived in queensland so i did most of my high school in queensland <laughs> okay and then the family moved back when i was 16 uh, and then i finished school in the uk went to uni in the uk and then i came back to Australia and I did backpacking and then got a job and was working in Melbourne. And then uh, after that, I ended up moving back to the UK again. I was in UK for another, I think, I have to do the maths, but I think another 15 years and then moved back uh, to Australia four years ago, coming up to four years ago. Why why come back? Why come back to Australia? Because Australia yeah. is, is is my home. That's where I, I'm going to live. I'd always wanted, even you know, when I was had my formative years here, I guess, when I was a teenager. Um, and I, I think since we moved here, I kind of always thought of Australia as my home and, you know, moved back and forth a bit. But I, I'd always really intended on being in Australia longer yeah. term, you know, and I, I, there are reasons for that. Um, you know, I, I, I like the culture of Australia and that and the kind of the, the more... <laughs> level playing field if you like and i'm very dubious about the the class system in in uk as probably comes through with a lot of my uh anti-monarchy rants um <laughs> well it's a com i'm finding it's a more and more common thing see like we were speaking before i worked in finance and half of my colleagues maybe even three quarters are either from the uk malaysia or singapore um some from hong kong Every now and then, um, but so mainly expats, uh, apart from Aussies, naturally, and uh, it's it's the same thing. You know, they ca- they've come from a region that's sort of outside London, let's say, um, and life just is is hard there. If you you know, like particularly, I've had friends from um, from Liverpool, and uh, this one friend of mine would tell me like the way that they were treated in the city of London. If if you're from Liverpool, even though he had an amazing, amazing background in, in education and whatnot, unless you'd gone to Eton, you were not getting into one of the big four banks or investment banks. Um, so it's a it sounds like a real shame. Yeah, I I think that look, I think that you know that should be fading over time, and you know lots of people who haven't been to. Uh, kind of private schools and have had a wealthy upbringing are, are in well for example in parliament is kind of shifting over time and media is shifting over time but even still you look at tv presenters in the uk and radio presenters and it's very much this kind of you know the private school or the the eaton voice um that is very much dominant um australia of course is not a completely equal society and has its problems 
um, as all societies, uh, I would suggest even the ones that aren't supposed to have problems with uh, inequality. Um, but I think it's it's much more of an equal society in Australia. It's certainly less visible. Oh, yeah. The differences between your high, middle and lower classes are, it, in comparison to the UK and the US, vastly different. Mm. It's why it is so brilliant to live here, mm. I think. I, and, and Paul Keating often talks about this and I'm I find myself economically and politically being very wary of how that changes mm. over time because I think the our success as a society here is the fact that your middle class still exists whereas in a lot of places like the UK some parts of Europe and the US not so much mm-hmm. uh, but I, I I think though one I mean I look I, I love Australia and it's it's, it's my home and <laughs> I'm you know married to an Australian and I'm, I'll stay here even if I leave temporarily this it is my long-term home but one thing that frustrates me is I do think that there is a lot of complacency in Australia and particularly political complacency and my reasoning for that is because people generally have such a great standard of living and lifestyle that most people don't really they're not really as interested but in the UK uh kind of things small things go wrong um and people campaign on it straight away whereas here People don't tend, and going back to the Australian Republican movement, I think people don't do much campaigning here. And I think part of it is because uh, there just isn't that kind of will to change things so much because mm. people, you know, are, are pretty generally, you know, uh, have a pretty good standard of living. Not everyone, but it's even people at lower ends of society have a pretty decent um, income compared to many parts of the world. I mean, for example, the minimum wage in Australia, um, even uh, the um, New Start allowance in Australia is much higher than it would be in uh, other countries. Mm. So even on minimum wage in Australia, you can have a better lifestyle, in my opinion, than you can in uh, London, for example. When I was in London, I was living in a house share uh, and I moved to Melbourne say four years ago and for the same money got a one bedroom flat you know <laughs> and and I, my lifestyle is just a different world to what it was in London and that's not to say I don't like London because I love London uh, as well as great place to live and experience but you know it, uh, my lifestyle here is, is much better. Yeah and I think you're right about the complacency I think that's just a a uh, that mindset in Australia is a result of geopolitical things that exist. Just the simple fact that we're an island nation and it's so hard to impact us through immigration or war or any things that changes our society in any way. And we've also had 70 plus years of no real, I guess, economic upheaval, mm-hmm. like major economic, like the Great Depression. So, and, and as a nation, that, uh, an island nation that relies on trading, it means that we can have a pretty nice life. We can export, you know, sh- shit out of the ground and then import a bunch of stuff that we like to play around with. And I think that, yeah, you're definitely right. It's, it's the same reason why not much industry exists here is because we're very, very complacent. If you look at like the top, you know, organizations, entities, let's say top 10 or 20, the average age in Australia is something like, 180 to 160 years maybe whereas in america the average age in the top 10 to 20 is about 20 to 30 years i think that really highlights the fact that we just don't there's not a need because of because of where we are in the world there's not a need to sometimes think outside the box Hmm. and i think one of the uh looking at it from that from a more positive angle talking about kind of political complacency but I think one thing I, I definitely noticed moving back four years ago was the politics in Australia is not as nasty as it is in the UK. I think it can get quite nasty, uh, very polarised, um, and one person makes a small mistake and there's kind of lots of calls for them to resign, petitions, etc. And I think one benefit, if you like, of having political complacency is you don't get that so much. I think it's a, even though I think I'm sure many Australians would think the political debate here is is pretty base and can get quite nasty. I think compared to most countries, it, it's actually quite polite. Oh, it's very easy going. I, I just think that's because there's less political angst here because, we, again, we don't have those major differences between upper, middle and lower class that may exist in, in say, the UK and the US. Mm. What, what do you miss about home? Not home, but the yeah, UK. Yeah, I say home. I, I, I don't call uh, UK home, but um, 
look, I, I do, you know, like London, and and I, there's the um, you know a bit of a cliche, but the London going being something happening every night. You know, you can go to on a Tuesday night, you can kind of go to a, the theatre and you go to a, a pub, and the pubs are full. You know, on Tuesday nights, mm. uh, you know, whereas in Melbourne and most places in Australia, in fact, not just there, in most places around the world, I've, I've got to say, um, you go out on a Tuesday night, even in the city, and there's not a lot happening yeah. so i miss that lots of business um going on um there's not a huge amount i i used to miss when i um lived in australia many years ago I used to miss the beer in uk because because they had lots of different ales yeah. good beer and good pubs um and when i lived in melbourne in 99 2000 I was, you know, one of the things I, I, I was, you know, made me did want to move back sometimes was uh, you get all of the pubs, basically your choice was Carlton Draft or VB um, and all of the pubs were the kind of lino floors and the tall yeah. stools. And now that has changed so much that actually I've kind of knocked that off my list that even though I think the pubs in the UK are undoubtedly uh, better, on average you get the old, uh, really old kind of, you know, 200 plus year old um, pubs. In the village where I'm from, you know, the pub is probably about 300 years old, if, if not more. Um, but when I was back in UK a couple of years ago, I had a pint of beer that I was really looking forward to this ale. And I had a sip of it and I said to my now wife, who's Australian, this beer is warm and flat, which is <laughs> showed me, you know, I've become more Australian than I probably ever thought I would. Yeah. I mean, i got to hand it to the UK. I know... It- a lot of Australians like to give the pom shit about their beer, but you know, you go to some places like I remember going to Cornwall and you just go into a nice seaside pub and they've got like 20 different local beers on tap. And maybe you could argue that sort of that slow beer, the microbrewery movement had already hit the UK before a show, but I've got a sense that it had you'd always had that sort of regionality in things mm-hmm. like beers, whereas for us, it was always like. Yeah, you're right. Back in that era, it was Cullen Draft, um, VB, maybe like a Melbourne bitter, a Geelong bitter. It's just horrible, horrible beers, even though it was colder and yeah. a bit more sparkly. Well, they have had was, their long kind of history of ales in, in the UK. I mean, again, that probably goes back hundreds of years with the different ales. Um, but interestingly, I think there is a bit of tension between the old traditional ales and the new microbreweries. Oh, yeah. Uh, because the, I think many of the old... Uh, ale brewers and old ale drinkers don't really see this cold bubbly stuff even though it is um, essentially ale but the craft beers coming through don't really see that as the proper uh, real ale so <laughs> I think there is a bit of that tension which I kind of think is uh, pretty silly really and, and I think they should you know gang up against the, the lager drinkers rather than trying to uh, fight it amongst themselves yeah I think I think they just need to get with the times it sounds mm. like it now, what was your initial intrigue in politics? Like we mentioned before, uh, I think it's been mentioned many times when you've done interviews or, or whatnot, but you've basically worked on the Republican campaign. You're a parliamentary researcher. Re- Republic campaign, Republic. I should say, rather than not the US Republican, which is <laughs> the often, Republic often campaign. Uh, oh, yeah. um, you were you were actually a Liberal Democrat candidate. I think you place second the highest ever in that region, which was uh, northwest Norfolk. Yep. Uh, and then you were a political advisor and communications researcher as, as well. So I know that you originally started that firm that was that was overtake, overtaken or acquired by Gartner, and then you sort of moved towards mm. politics. W- w- it, how did that happen, I guess? Is, so that, is well, I that, I, I, when I uh, left, so I was doing... Uh, IT data essentially uh, in a company near Oxford in the UK um, and running through lots of computer prices and spreadsheets and I think uh, ultimately I kind of thought there's got to be more to life than this as, as much as as, the, as good as the company were to me I was getting more and more interested in politics I was uh, sitting on a, a Thursday night watching Question Time, the equivalent to Australia's yeah. Q&A, and kind of shouting at the TV and getting a bit frustrated by it. And the general election was coming up, which had been the 2005 general election. 
And I actually then, because I was bored of my job, um, and I kind of thought that, hey, this is a good chance to dip my toe in the water. And I remember saying to my boss at the time, um, I resigned and basically said, look, um, I want to get involved in politics. And I think he thought I was a bit mad and he tried to uh, convince me to stay on and said, well, you know, you can still have a job here and we can just pretend this didn't happen. Uh, but, you know, uh, you, you go and have a kind of a, a look at what's going on in politics and then you can kind of come back and work here. And I volunteered for uh, an MP who was from my local area in, in Norfolk, uh, from where I'm from in the UK, a guy called Norman Lamb, who's still an MP now um, for the Liberal Democrats. And I basically volunteered to go around delivering leaflets for him. I started off stuffing envelopes. Uh, and I was stood in a campaign shop and stuffing envelopes. And um, I went from stuffing envelopes to delivering leaflets and delivering leaflets and knocking on doors. And at the end of the election campaign, uh, this guy, who I'd never heard of before that election campaign, I've, I've got to say, um, he said to me, hey, what are you doing after the election? And I said, well, I'll be looking for a new job by the sounds of it. And he said, well, you know, you can come if I get re-elected, you can come and work for me in... Uh, Westminster, uh, not for any money, but you can come and work for free for a bit if you like, um, because that's how it was. Um, and I was a bit reluctant to do that because it was a big risk for me and you know I didn't have the money to go and work for free in London, but I thought it was a good opportunity. So I went and worked in his office then. I think I was there for a couple of months and then a job actually came up in his office, um, which I then applied for and obviously was in a good position to to get it and got offered a job so I ended up then working there and stayed in working in Westminster for the same MP for three years so I guess I was in the right time at the right place the right place at the right time um, or at least kind of put myself I guess in the right place at the right time and lucked out a bit and ended up then working in Westminster and, and moved to London for that and then ended up working in politics for several years yeah and, and obviously as you mentioned you, you came out here uh, you've been working as I guess a what I have here is a communications researcher slash advisor while you got into this blogging thing. I think from what I could find, the first piece you put out was in October 2016. Um, and I, I couldn't actually find, I can't actually remember what, what it was about, but you put that out, then a few months later you, start, you put out another piece and then it was Feb 2017 that this, uh, I guess... Victorian expenses scandal mm. started to be covered. I think you were the first to cover this, right? Yeah. So how does how do you go from that to there? Like, had you already been writing in the background over the years? Like, wh why did you go? All right, I need to start a blog. And yeah. So just uh, as a, uh, I guess, just going back to why I started the blog, I have for many years so I've, I've worked in um i've worked in politics kind of campaigning uh, media related jobs for a, a long time now and as part of those jobs as you do i was finding news stories uh and i was doing freedom of information for example um, and other kind of data related stories uh, and i was getting essentially stories that i was then giving away to people because you're doing it for the mp i worked for or you're doing it for councillors that you work with the local councillors I, I worked with in London, or you're doing it for campaign organisations. So when I moved back to Australia four years ago, I kind of thought, well, now's an opportunity to try and see if I can still do some of this stuff, but I'll just do it in my own name. So I had already been doing a lot of this ah, stuff before, okay, okay. but that was the first time I'd really started putting things in my own name. And I started to blog, to be honest, really, more than anything, as a repository to put the different stories that I found on. I... I'm going to always continue to put in freedom of information requests to find information I think might be interesting uh, and have a look into uh, any kind of stories I think might go somewhere. And I thought, well, look, I, I, in the past, I've even had people come to me and say, hey, do you remember that freedom of information request you put in? Um, you know, can I have a have a look at it um, and have a look at the results that came back from it? And for whatever reason, I can't find it because it's buried somewhere in your inbox. So I actually, as much as anything, thought I would set up a blog as a repository, put all my stories on there, all of the information I find, and then you can actually go back through it and find uh, the different things that you've done and have a bit of a, a scrapbook, if you like, of what you've done. And then the Victorian expenses scandal uh, came about, and that was really what prompted me to start doing 
the blog seriously and and putting up um, news stories on it and actually trying to do more newsy stories rather than just uh, as a scrapbook for different research that I'd done. Uh -huh. So by by that time, what was really guiding you was things that were generally out there in the zeitgeist, so to speak. It sort of sounds like that. And that's sort of how things like the Barnaby discovery came about because you were you were looking generally what was going on and, and, and looking deeper into that. Look, I'm just, uh, well, nosy is one way of putting it, but I'm just inquisitive. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I have been in the past always putting in, for example, um, freedom, freedom of information requests in the UK, even if it's not something that's directly related to me, just because I'm interested to know what the answer is that comes back. So it's, it wasn't any kind of great, conspiracy about me wanting to you know take down barnaby joyce <laughs> it wasn't anything about me kind of wanting to make a name for myself i am generally interested in getting to the bottom of things um and understanding them better and where i can see uh you know or smell a story in something i'll follow it through uh, and try and get to the bottom of it and that's what happened in the case of um both the victorian expenses scandal and the barnaby joyce thing i was really looking into it for my own purposes as much as anything and trying to find out if there's anything behind it. Why um, continue with the day job? Yeah, I know you've mentioned that there's not much money in, in this sort of work for journalism, but you've published a lot with uh, the ABC, I think, Daily Telegraph, Crikey, uh, quite a lot. So, I mean, if you really gave it a, you know, a good going, I feel like there could be something there, isn't there? Oh, thanks. It's nice of you to say <laughs> that. Um, yeah, look, I, I, my background has been in in comms and, um, say, media uh, and campaigns. And I guess that was where I have seen myself um, for a long time. And it's only really, you know, the last yeah, few years, really, that I've really ramped up the journalism side of it. Um, so it's something I would definitely consider. One thing I really enjoy, though, is doing the research behind it and getting deep into a story. What I've been reluctant to do is to do you know the death knock of going and knocking on people's doors who's just had relatives died and that kind of thing i don't i don't want to do i don't know that's a bit pompous of me because that's where many journalists started out doing that but i really enjoy the kind of deep research rather than the um rather than the the, the more kind of day-to-day -day journalism of it mm -hmm. so i guess there are things like investigative journalism you get involved with um I'm actually at the moment writing a book um, and I'm writing a book on uh, parliamentary allowances, MPs pay and allowances. Um, bit of a niche topic, but again, I'm doing it as much for myself as <laughs> as for anything because I really can get into the detail of, uh, of this stuff, have a look at some of the past stories and the rules around it and kind of create a, a body of work, I guess, that I can go back to uh, and find and pull out the, the kind of various stories and have something on record that I've I've done. That was one thing that you you have definitely said that you have an unhealthy interest in mm. parliamentary allowances, and I think that's sort of loosely connected to nepotism that can happen in politics. Um, maybe one thing just to make clear for for the audience is discussing freedom of, inf of information, what it actually is, because I don't think I don't think many people would know about it. Um, so I think in a nutshell for people playing home, the way I'd explain it is that as part of living in a democracy, you have the right to request information from the government. And in some instances, the government may challenge that depending on, I don't know, maybe it's defense related or um, it could be sensitive information of some kind. Mm. Do you think that's right in a nutshell? Yeah, that's essentially it. My, my explanation would be that it is a general right to access documents mm -hmm. uh, from government from so from government central government from government agencies government departments uh, through state government departments and agencies but also then going further to things like schools universities hospitals um, so anything which is essentially public sector you have the right to ask for information now there are some exemptions around that like security uh, agencies for example um, and things like census information uh, there are various exemptions uh, that mean you can't get hold of that information but what it is supposed to mean is that anybody can access uh, information which people have done on your behalf my uh, general philosophy around open government is that 
we are the ones that elect people to represent us. We're the ones that pay for it. They are doing it, in theory at least, on for our us. behalf. Yeah. Everything that the Prime Minister does, everything that your local MP does, your local councillor does, the Department of Education, you know, everything that they do is supposed to be for the benefit of Australians or certainly a, a section of Australia. And if they're doing that on our behalf and we're paying for it, I don't see any reason why they should withhold that information unless there is a genuine good reason. Like you say, for example, if it would compromise potential security, uh, potential security threat or would compromise an individual's privacy. And those exemptions are all in the Act. My frustration often with the FOI Act is that departments often go much further than that. And they will try to withhold information, which is perfectly reasonable to get, just because they don't really feel like, you know, handing out this kind of information. So I'll give you an example. <laughs> uh, the Australian Parliament, um, so Australian Parliament House, is not actually covered by the Freedom of Information Act. And some of the battles I've had with them to try and get information is absolutely ridiculous. Asking them for uh, a menu for the restaurant in the houses in the Parliament House where the MPs go, a sample menu, the lunch menu, and they wouldn't provide it to me. Uh, and I had to have a battle with them, basically running battle to try and get hold of this menu, a sample menu, which I wanted to know kind of what they were serving there as part of my research into parliamentary allowances and some of the subsidies that are provided. I also asked them, for example, for a list of um, lobbyists who have passes, security passes to Parliament House. Mm. And they wouldn't provide me with that either, which is provided as you know, standard in, in the UK, in US, New Zealand. This is kind of all on, on record. And they wouldn't provide me with a list because they said that it would affect the ability of MPs and senators to do their jobs. Because if they <laughs> knew, if, if the public rather knew uh, which lobbyists were in Parliament um, going around with their passes on that for some reason MPs and senators uh, would be restricted from doing their job. They didn't really explain it much further. So there are a lot of these examples where it's not, and they're not under the FOI Act, but, you know, uh, but which is another problem in itself. You know, there's a lot of examples that I think where um, the government is not giving out information that it, it should be, which there's no good reason to, to withhold it other than just it feels like we probably shouldn't give this out because it's going to put us in a negative light. So who who isn't covered under the Act? Parliament? Uh, so Parliament itself is not covered under the Act. Okay. Uh, so all of the departments are. MPs' allowances yeah. um, federally are covered under the Act because they are uh, dealt with by the Department of Finance and the IPA, uh, the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority. But Parliament itself, so anything around actual uh, things happening um, that it, uh, on the parliamentary estate are not covered by it. And then you get the security uh, uh, agencies, like ASIO is not covered by it, for example. You get census information is not covered by it. Really? Uh, Royal Commissions, uh, for example, not covered by it. The Government General is not covered by it, except for, for administrative information, uh, like financial information. But you can't ask, for example, uh, for documents around um, the granting of honours. Uh, so there are various uh, organisations agencies um, that aren't covered by FOI, but it covers many more uh, than it doesn't cover. Uh, so virtually all of the uh, federal agencies and departments are covered by it. Um, and certainly my advice for anybody, if they don't know, would be banging a freedom of information request and they'll soon tell you if they're not covered by it. <laughs> now, what can you request? You know, like when you do these submissions, to what extent, what can you ask for? That's so, reasonable. So you can ask for... Uh, any documents that they have. So one of the big flaws in Australian FOI legislation is that it only applies to documents. Whereas in the UK, for example, I used to ask, you can ask questions like, uh, how many police officers have been suspended for negligence over the last year or, or whatever? Um, and the department or agency would have to give you the answer to that. Whereas in Australia, if you ask... Uh, such a question they would generally say well that's not in the documents we're not going to tell you so it's a big restriction firstly 
in the Australian legislation. It has to be something which has already been compiled into a, a document. So things like spreadsheets are documents, uh, and there is some provision in there for information to be pulled and put into a document. But if if departments want to play hardball, they can say, for example, that uh, what you're requesting is not a document. But generally, every document um, that is part of the government records you can ask for, it includes text messages theoretically or there's been some debate about what is actually covered um what about, there, what about email so emails yeah e- certainly email change you can really? request wow. um but of course then you it could fall into one of the various exemptions so if you're asking for emails uh they're one of the exemptions which is widely used is deliberative documents so if they're saying um that the information requested is part of a discussion trying to come to a conclusion, uh, then it should be exempt. Now, that is a broadly used exemption, which kind of covers pretty much everything because everything you can say is is open to discussion. Um, so there are various exemptions. Um, but again, I would say the best thing to do if you uh, after a document is to put in an FOI request and see what comes back and see what exemptions are used. I've read through the FOI Act and I have a good feel for what exemptions are in place, but I don't think many other people have. I don't think many other people should be uh, forced to read through the Act. So in the absence of, of uh, sitting down and reading a 300-page um, piece of legislation, I would uh, suggest the best thing is probably just to, to ask and see what comes back. And most of these requests are made on... It's not on right to know, is it? It's there's a you go through that the information commissioner. So the best way to put in an FOI request is to uh, go. I, I'd probably just Google FOI uh, with the name of the department or agency. Most of them, the federal departments have an address which is normally FOI at you know education or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's a bit different, so make sure you you Google it. But generally, there's an email address. Some of them have forms to fill in. Um, states do it a bit different in Victoria for example it's on the Victorian Information Commissioner's website mm-hmm. um, because there is a charge in uh, in all of the states um, there is a charge for information uh, so they use it as a way of then taking your credit card details and charging you for the privilege of asking for information that you've already paid to be um, put <laughs> together uh, anyway um, why are they allowed to do that? And the federal government doesn't do it. Well, thankfully, the federal government doesn't do it. Uh, the ACT doesn't charge either. Um, but I guess the, they would say really it's to pay for some of the costs behind it. In Victoria uh, and most states, it's a thirty dollar charge or, or thereabouts. Um, in Queensland, it's a bit higher. Uh, I suspect the real reason is to try to discourage people from putting in FOI requests. Um, and look, it's certainly a big hindrance because uh, if you want to, for example, in UK, um, uh, just an example where many of my examples are going to come from, <laughs> you get regular stories in the media about local councils and what local councils have been doing, how much they've been spending on whatever. One of the ways of getting that information is doing round robin FOIs to all of the different councils. For example, the council, you know, uh, send it to the thirty odd councils in London, asking for, uh, you know, how much they're spent on, you know, plastic coffee cups or whatever it is you want to try and find out. In Australia, that's really restrictive because as soon as you start sending out FOIs to councils, you're being charged thirty dollars a time, and you're soon going to get hit with a big bill. Jeez. So I do think it's pretty restrictive, and I would certainly, you know, even if you're going to have a charge um, to try and deter any unnecessary requests, which I think are minimal anyway, I think the charge should be, a, you know, maximum of, of ten bucks. I think would be fair. I think thirty dollars is actually quite restrictive. The other point I would make about charges is. Freedom of information saves public money uh, because it increases the scrutiny of what's going on. So when the Victorian uh, expenses scandal came about, which wasn't directly through um, uh, FOI, that had some FOI involvement in there for me initially trying to get hold of lists of second um, of MPs claiming the second home allowance, the two... Uh, senior MPs who stood down ended paying back hundreds of thousands of dollars back Hmm. to taxpayers because of the money that they had ripped off. And 
if you increase the level of uh, access to information and you increase the level of scrutiny of public uh, authorities on of them and of MPs, as also happens with the MPs' allowances, travel allowances at a federal level, you're going to get MPs firstly paying back money, but more importantly, not trying to rip off that money to start with. So as soon as uh, the information around travel allowances became more public for MPs, uh, my guess is, and I think I, I would be uh, pretty accurate with this, is that all of a sudden MPs would take fewer journeys which were um let's put it kindly unnecessary uh for their work and the public is saving money so i think any uh, improvement in open government and improvement in freedom of information uh, and other accountability is going to actually save money yeah i think that oversight is particularly important and i was going to ask you at some point during the interview what 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 was the commonality amongst all of this work that you've done and these investigations and i would say what we were talking about before was that sort of nepotism that you can find in politics the way i'd explain nepotism is people just using their i guess place of privilege for monetary or um some sort of political benefit whether that's you know rorting money from from the system through making ridiculous claims about (laughs) about travel and and how that relates to their work or you know, there's there's all sorts of ideas. So I guess I'm curious for you, how how do you see nepotism in politics, at least in Australia? And have you seen it? Have you seen it rising? Uh, what's often the cause of it? I, I guess I'm just curious around that in particular. I am one of the. I think it's probably fair to say one of the most outspoken and biggest. Critics of um, MPs' allowances in Australia, uh, and I'm continually, you know, outraged by some of the things that they get away with. However, Australia has a very low level of political corruption. We've got to put that in perspective, and I always try to do that. There's a lot of criticism that MPs get, for example, for things like parliamentary pensions and travel allowances, you know, going to the Gold Coast to buy a flat or going to colleagues' weddings, etc. I've done a lot of research on parliamentary allowances and it is a lot worse. And I'm not just talking about, you know, countries in um, Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe. Um, I'm talking about some of the countries in Europe, uh, Western Europe as well. Um, In the UK clearly had their big problem, which is actually 10 years ago uh, this month when the expenses scandal broke there. I think Australia, we're very lucky to have a low corruption uh, country and I don't think on the whole politicians do rip off the system however I don't think there's an excuse for any in Australia and I think where there is uh, any corruption or the rorting of expenses I think that needs to be called out um, and politicians are there obviously to kind of represent uh, the community and the people that vote for them and Australia as a whole They need to be held to a high standard. Uh, So if we can reduce that corruption down to zero, I think that would be even better than it is now. But certainly I'm I'm not anti-politics. I'm not anti-politician. You know, I I once stood for parliament. I mean, I so I I tried to be a politician in that sense. I'm a failed politician myself. Um, But, you know, I, I, I don't go along with the narrative that all politicians are out for themselves. Mm. I don't go along with the narrative that all all politicians are on the rort um, and that they're only in it for the money. Uh, I think far from it. However, I do think that there is still uh, too high levels of MPs misusing their allowances and misusing their power uh, for kind of personal gain and probably more commonly the gain of their party, their political party. So it is, it's it's more the fact that although it's a small amount, there there are still some people that continue to do it, and that yeah. you, you know I get a sense that this book that you're writing could be a um, a form of medicine to to quell mm. to quell this sort of stuff and uncovering thing. Um, it, would you say that yeah. that you're going to be covering things that would change that you like to change? To yeah. So sort of stuff? so one of the things I've I've covered in in the in the book that I'm I'm writing and I'm kind of um, you know still plugging away at it. Um, but the first chapter of it is MPs pay. How much should we pay MPs? 
And so for that, I was looking back at the history of uh, how much MPs are paid. Um, without giving away kind of spoilers, um, too many spoilers, the problem has always been there. You know, people think, you know, politicians are overpaid now and they're getting these pay rises and it, it's not like it used to be. But actually back very early on in the history of Australia and the Australian new Australian parliament, politicians were giving themselves pay rises and there was public outrage over it. You know, um, my, one of the questions I try to answer for myself is what is the correct level of pay for politicians? Should they be paid more or should they be paid less? And I've looked at how much politicians are paid right around the world australia and i don't think this is this is uh, is um news to many people australian politicians are, are very highly paid compared to the rest of the world uh and compared to the average incomes um of the country they represent uh, australia is one of the highest paid um, sets of politicians in the world you know state parliamentarians in tasmania get paid more than uh national parliamentarians in the uk for example really? You know, it's, it's high, higher pay in Australia. And that's partly to do with because um, wages in Australia are high because of the exchange rate uh, and the living costs. But even factoring in that, Australian politicians are highly paid. But should they be paid more or should they be paid less? And I, I you know, I, I, unfortunately, I, I kind of have to sit on the fence, I think, with it a little bit. I wouldn't necessarily advocate for a cut in politicians' pay, but I think there's no good reason to give them a, a higher pay rise. And a lot of the controversy comes not because of the level of pay, but pay rises. And my focus, my immediate focus in Australia would be on uh, on limiting pay rises to inflation rates, for example, rather than some of the huge bumps, 30% bumps that politicians have enjoyed over the years that caused public outrage and I think caused a lot of cynicism in politics. So the, my focus um, would be, uh, you know, to, uh, to a compromise to not worry too much about the pay level, leave it where it is for the moment, but just to limit the pay rises. Um, so, you know, writing a book on MPs paying expenses raises questions for me that I have to think about. And that was part of the purpose for me. You know, how high is corruption? How many MPs are corrupt in Australia? Um, and it's interesting for me looking into that and kind of trying to actually challenge some of my own thinking. So I don't just want it to be a book knocking MPs and the kind of political classes uh, for uh, taking, being on the take and kind of rotting. I actually want it to be a bit more of a look um, at things like parliamentary pension, for example, which is very misunderstood and a tool that is often used for people saying, well, look at the big parliamentary pensions. Yeah. But any politician that's elected from 2004 onwards doesn't get a parliamentary pension anyway. They get superannuation, effectively, um, pr pretty much in line with the public sector. So there are a lot of myths around it. And for me, part of it is trying to clear up some of those myths that come around politicians' pay and louses. Uh -huh. Now, w one of the things that I wanted to touch on was free speech and, and how this all relates. I mean, you... We've said you've delved into some pretty large cases. Uh, there, at the moment, you've got one going on with the the, the Queen's letters to the PM. It's obviously Barnaby, uh, the expenses scandal as well. As we get sort of further down, I just generally where we are politically right now, you know, things around censorship on social media platforms, um, or maybe it's sort of the rise further of populous leaders the more we get down this track the more i feel like i'm becoming a free speech sort of absolutist in a way um no, no matter the situation i guess i was just curious as to where, where do you sit on all of that as someone who actively looks for oversight of government where do you see free speech right now globally mm. in in the western world that's uh, a big question a, a tricky one I, my you know i'm a uh, a liberal and um, really you know I, I, as you know I st once stood for election as a liberal democrat candidate in the UK generally my view would be that people should be able to do whatever the hell they want to do until it starts impacting on other people and harming other people 
there are huge questions around that at the moment, particularly with the um, uh, alt right and even going as far as kind of Nazism, which has seen a, a resurgence. And how much should those people be having, able to have a say? We've had things like the St Kilda rally, um, where we've had some kind of Nazi symbols and memorabilia uh, on display. Um, and, you know, I, I can't really answer that question in an absolute. Um, but I think there are some worrying signs of uh, that kind of um, discussion being allowed and allowed under the premise of anybody should be able to say what they want to, whereas actually it is harmful to people. Mm. Um, and that comes back, for example, to the uh, the vote on gay marriage, for example, and some of the things that, that I think that raised a lot of those issues as well. How much should be, people be able to have their own opinions? Um, if it's a genuinely held opinion, despite the fact it, it is potential harm for other people. So um, generally I would be up for free speech, but I wouldn't go as far as saying that I'm a, a libertarian and, and anything <laughs> goes. There has to be some, um, you know, free speech is not free for, for everybody. You know, it, it can have damaging Im- impact. So there has to be some personal responsibility, uh, but I certainly think that there is a, there is a limit to free speech, albeit one which is you know pretty high um bar to to cross yeah i think i mean it's pretty obvious that if you start crossing the lines when it comes to inciting violence that we have laws that that deal with that but, but where's but where when but inciting but the thing that i i struggle with so is inciting violence and you could say okay well you know um you know if somebody is actively saying you know we i'm uh you know nazi or whatever and uh, you know I, I don't you know i think that we should uh incite violence and or even rallying for a um a physical attack on somebody or even a rally you know trying to get together people for a rally that could have a uh a, a violent outcome but i think the the thing that many people including myself struggle with is well, then, you know, had the issue with Blair Cottrell. Um, in fact, I, I, I'm reluctant to actually kind of use his name because I don't think it's useful, you know, promoting people and kind of making celebrities out of them. Um, but, you know, going on Sky News and, and how far should people, um, for example, in, uh, again, going, don't mean to always go back to the UK, but the British National Party over there um, were invited uh, years ago on to Question Time you know, the Q&A equivalent. And, you know, there were protests around that. Um, and it was a tricky one. And I, I struggled with whether the leader of the British National Party should be allowed on. Um, I sided with the fact I thought he should have been allowed on because he wasn't actually inciting uh, any uh, violence. He was, um, his, and his party was within the law and standing for election within the law. The feeling was that having him on, the feeling by many people is that having him on that program legitimised it. And I, I think, you know, that's a, a credible opinion to hold. Um, I would rather see those kind of views exposed. And as it happened in yeah. that, that case, the vote for the, he looked, um, he looked, I think, pretty amateur as a politician. And the vote plummeted after that. I don't know necessarily how much of a direct relationship it had with that person going on that program. Um, but I think it, we do have to expose those views as well. So yeah. look, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving a clear answer because it's not a, an easy thing to answer. But I would generally side on on the uh, on you know giving um, holding people to account um, and asking the questions. But at the same time, uh, you have to be careful not to actively promote those kind of opinions and, and like I say, make celebrities out of people that really don't deserve to be celebrities. Yeah, I think the the issue is that. Um as when it comes to the topic of free speech right now, the way it's spun is that uh, it's it's all just the alt right that's using that catch all phrase to to get airtime. And the re- I think when it comes to that group of people, the more we can get their ideas out there, the more we can quell it. Because I think with that thing in St Kilda, what I found uh, really good was the amount of people that were talking about how despicable some mm. of the views are. And I think. Um, you know, like I like to go look at f- these platforms like 4chan and 8chan regularly because I just want to see w- what is the the stupid viewpoint that hmm. that a certain group of people are looking at right now politically. And we had we had this roundtable recently with um, 
a bunch of comedians and they were all saying that they wish that this stuff was out there more because then they could basically pick it apart. Hmm. Um, and I guess the, the problem is when it comes to the far right in particular, we're all hung over from what happened in World War II and how nor- normal ordinary people can, can turn down this path of what happened with, with Nazis. I mean, we still have ethno-nationalists and hmm. Nazis that exist today. So, it's a, yeah, it's not an easy easy question at all. But the thing that concerns me is that when that group is connected to free speech, then everyone thinks anyone who's connected to free speech is related to that group. Mm. And that's what I get scared with with the current censoring of people online. And I, I found it interesting. I heard this thing recently, like the Supreme Court had ruled that uh, that supposedly uh, being being able to access a like a Facebook or Twitter or something like that was a was an hour right related to the First Amendment. I'm not sure how true that is, but but yeah, I, I've I found this whole topic interesting because I just read um, uh, what is it by John Stuart Mills on liberty. It's the first time I've ever read the book on free speech, basically, um, and yeah, it ra- it raises a lot of these interesting interesting questions mm. particularly with the way that technology is is accelerating it at the moment mm. one of the other things i i, I guess which is a I, I struggle with a bit is that some of these views many of these views are by stupid individuals or, or individuals i should say that say stupid things and they're not reflective of a wider population mm. yet they get amplified so much because of the now the way that people take in consume kind of media and social media so as an example in, in during the election you know we've had um news stories about various leaflets that have been going around and it happened in the um equal marriage uh plebiscite as well national news stories about um, one poster being found in a laneway or, you know, somebody letterboxing in one particular street. Well, that doesn't necessarily represent many people. Mm. and I. But it's amplified because of the, you know, the media uh, arena that we have now, whereas somebody takes a le- one letter or one poster, sticks it on Twitter, the next thing you've got a journalist kind of getting in touch saying, you know, atting you and saying, hey, can I use this and put it on, on my, um, into my news story? And then all of a sudden you've got a headline news story. As we've had during the election, for example, for leaflets being distributed uh, against uh, Karen Phelps in Sydney. Well, I, I don't see how you know those views should be held so um, in, in so much importance, if you like, because anybody can go and run off you know a dozen leaflets and and put them around, and probably a lot of it is self promotion, sticking it on Twitter themselves and trying to create a bit of buzz about it. Um, so I do think with the whole free speech debate, there is a bit of an issue around actually how generally. Um, those views are within society and how how much they are actually just one, you know, not even radical person, but one crank essentially putting around some kind of leaflet or view, yeah. which then gets sold as a wider um, view or movement. Yeah, but you can't, you'll never stop those views. There's always going to be people that have those views. And I, I, I know what you mean, but the, the fact is we voted in gay marriage. So there you go. It sort of shows the the... The ideas capitalism that exists in our market showed that that view is not relevant, and that's that's but, what I want to see. But it is. But those views often, I guess, my point is that those views often get headlines, even yeah, top, I think top headlines in media outlets. Whereas actually, it is just such a you know yeah, insignificant because thing it in the sells it sells advertising, and I, I think that um. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you about the the current state of media because I really think the two are just connected. And I think, I mean, these are things we've already scu- discussed on on previous podcasts with where a monetization is going mm. and ha- what what incentives does it provide journalists? You know, like, do, would you like to see more subscription paywalls as opposed to advertising for clicks, or do you think that even if you have the subscription paywall, it still incentivizes that behavior anyway as opposed to investigative work that you do Mm. i was listening to uh your podcast uh with nick hodges um yeah yeah, yeah. i was actually just listening 
recently, um, knowing that I was coming on here and it was one that I listened to, which is interesting and covered this uh, subject a, a bit and there's some interesting points raised. So um, it, it is, again, it's, it's something I'm afraid if I'm not going to be able to give a, a full answer to because if I could solve that problem, then I you know, wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be in a, you know, in a, in a big boardroom somewhere owning most of the world's uh, media. Um, I, I think the Guardian model, uh, where they do, so they have kind of advertising, but then they are asking for donations as well. Yeah, I personally like that because I think it's it covers both of those worlds. It covers the commercial world, and it does. So I've previously been involved in um, or had some experience of doing crowdfunding for, um, particularly for MPs, but also for campaign things. Yeah. So it strikes me as a bit of a, a crowdfunding model. Now, how sustainable long term that is, uh, I don't know for a big organisation you know, like the Guardian. But I certainly think for um, smaller organisations, I haven't done it instantly for my um, blog, at least not yet. But trying to get in money and saying, "Hey, look, you know, I I need a you know a few grand or whatever it is uh, to run for the next month or whatever it is," um, and trying to raise money from the people that are interested. So essentially, it's a, it's a kind of form of charity, I guess, isn't it? Of people, it is, yeah. people liking what you do and wanting to donate to it. Um, but the other thing that was covered in your uh, podcast with um, Nick Hodges was about, uh, I guess, um, media organisations coming together to find a solution to it. So rather than uh, one of the points that was made was, you know, you're paying $10 a month for this one and another $5 a month for this one. Yeah. Um, and people don't want to, I certainly don't want to have lots of different subscriptions, but I want to l- read lots of different uh, websites. So I look at you know virtually all, all of the different main news websites, um, and I do have subscription for uh, you know the Australian and um, and for the News Corp and Herald Sun as well, uh, and then for Crikey who I write for sometimes as well. Um, but actually, what would be useful is if some of those organisations that were aligned did come together and there was uh, some somehow. A way of paying, I think, uh, as Nick Hodges put it, you know, Netflix approach, you know, ten dollars all you can eat, and then you go and uh, you can go around to the different media companies. So I think something on. I, I personally, I, I'm not a, a media expert. Such I've worked in the media and related jobs for a long time, but I'm not an expert at all in um, in that kind of uh, media business. Um, but you would but have, I, you would have seen from the work that you've done what what people like the yeah, most. Yeah, and I, I don't think subscriptions for lots of different websites is. I, I I don't think it's particularly. It's not tenable. It's, no, it's particularly tenable. Um, and media companies are they're all struggling with it and trying the different ways. Um, but yeah, but my my personal uh, my personal preference would be for a like I said a guardian approach of trying to politely ask people to donate towards the good work you're doing. But whether or not that's uh, going to be a, a longer term success, I don't know. Um, before we jump into some short rapid fire type questions to finish off, I just want to ask you about Brexit. Hmm. How have you seen that from afar? People often ask me about Brexit and I, I you know, always remind them I haven't lived in the country for four years, so I'm <laughs> kind of behind and Australians seem to be fascinated by Brexit and I think many Australians I've spoken to know a lot more about Brexit than me. Um, it's because our politics are so boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Uh, and probably because I've been so sick of it over many, the years I spent in the UK and in UK politics, you know, sick of talking about um, Europe and the whole issue. Um, look, I, when I, you know, I, I for many years, uh, you know, I've, I've been uh, hearing the debate about Europe, should we be in, shouldn't we be in? My own uh, feeling is I think a lot of it does come back to um, xenophobia. I know lots of Brexit voters say, no, it's not about that. It's about us have our, having our own control. Um, I'll just tell you a, a quick story. When I was uh, when I was campaigning for the MP uh, who I used to work for many years ago uh, in Norfolk, um, where I'm from, and knocking on doors and knocking on doors down the, down the street and uh, trying to convince people to vote uh, Liberal Democrat. And there was a guy who had a UKIP poster in his garden um, outside his house and I wasn't even knocking on his door I think I was waiting for some people to uh, some of the people I was with to come back and this guy kind of came up to me and started saying well the Liberal Democrats well they're for Europe and did you know this about Europe and how terrible it is 
And I kind of generally try to, you know, humor him and put up with it um, and had a bit of a chat with him. Um, and then he said to me, did you know because of uh, Europe and the European Union, if you throw a snowball now, you can get put in jail. You can get put in jail. If you throw a snowball at somebody, you can get put in jail. And I said to him, what do you mean? He said, that's true. If you throw a snowball, it's European Union rules, you can get put in jail. And I just said to him then, oh, come on, you don't seriously believe that if you throw a snowball, you get put in jail. And he got quite aggressive at this point and the conversation turned and he put his face in my face and he said to me, he said, you don't know what it's like. You weren't here when the war is on. I don't want those wogs running our country. And it, that kind of summarized for me and it's always stuck with me. There's a lot of stuff around European Union rules and, you know, political correctness and snowballs and um, bendy bananas and that kind of stuff. But I do find for a lot of it, the underlying thing is this kind of xenophobia um, and, to, and, and a certain amount of um, harder kind of racism as well behind it, um, which is very worrying. Look, I think there are problems with Europe. Um, and particularly things like the MPs' expenses uh, have been a, a, a problem for a long time and the lack of transparency and the waste of money. But overall, um, I think is a benefit for the UK uh, and I would have voted for Remain. I didn't I didn't vote because I was living in Australia. I didn't think it was my place to be voting and won't be voting in, in the UK uh, again unless I was living there. Um, but yeah, it, the way it's dragged on, I think probably just signifies how much of a complicated thing it is beyond the very base you know should we be in or shouldn't be out actually it is much more complicated than that mm. and obviously now that has been played out over however long it is since the <laughs> referendum a few years three years or whatever years it is or so again, since yeah. the referendum and it and it's and that's kind of played out um and people are now realizing there isn't a simple solution to it and it's not just as simple as you know these wogs running our country or getting put in jail for a snowball there's actually a lot more uh, complications in it saying that my uh, as a democrat i think they should just get on with it and mm. i my personal view which is not shared by many of my um former liberal democrat colleagues is i think they should just get on with it um leave europe uh if it is a mistake if it proves to be a mistake i know it's not easy to just turn it around and uh, in the next year or two but in say 10 years then hopefully everybody would see you know the the reality of it and then have another vote and come back in but i think having other referendums and things i think is just going to complicate it further. yeah well it just it sort of subverts that that process that they've followed um like i'm not too i don't know too much about what the party lines were that that ran during the election campaign i ne i didn't pay any attention until it was the day of the election and my mate who was listening to the radio at work, I don't know why, but he just decided that day to listen to the radio and he was like, oh, Brexit is like full on happening, isn't it? And then we all just switched on Sky News and we were looking at it and it was like, wow, this is becoming a reality. Um, what's happened since then for me is is been interesting because as I've been pretty involved in fintech Australia, we've seen these sort of parties of... UK politicians, the City of London, sort of the, the mayor of the City of London coming out to Australia um, and seeing what they're doing. And it's sort of obvious to me now that they know that they have to do this. They're using Australia. This is, this is my sense of it. It seems like they're pivoting towards Asia. So, like, the, the work that I previously used to do used to talk about growth in different industries, economies, etc., and it's obvious that Asia is sort of the future region. You know, it's 45% of the global economy. It'll be 55% in the next four or five years, something like that. And uh, through what they're trying to do here in Australia, these sort of backdoor uh, free trade agreements, you know, the ability to have uh, to employ UK citizens over here in Australia, it sort of seems to me that they're really sort of pivoting towards Asia and whether that is the case, I don't know, but it just I get that sense now that um, they realise that there's not much of a future in, in Europe because of what's happened. So it's going to be interesting. I think, what, they've got till May 29th or something like that? <laughs> something like that. I, it, keeps, it keeps getting extended and changes. I've, I've lost track of, uh, of what's happening with it. Um, 
if they've got, I think they had a three month extension. So my suspicion is they'll wait for two and a half months and then they'll start trying to do something again. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 definitely going to be the case. I can already tell. Um, all right, morning routine. What does your morning routine look like? I am not much of a morning person. Um, I never have been. Uh, now we have a dog and okay. uh, the dog has encouraged me to get up early. So I'm up at 6 a.m. most days now, which is pretty early for me. Um, and taking the dog over the park. So we're normally over the, over the park by 7 a.m. Um, and then coming back and having my breakfast with ABC News uh, before getting on with work or whatever else I've got up okay. uh, for the day. And evening, how do you sort of decompress at night? Uh, I don't generally decompress. I generally do my day work, um, have my dinner, and then start uh, tapping away at my keyboard again, um, and then go to bed thinking about what I've been tapping or what I can tap on my computer about in the coming days, (laughs) um, and then generally dream about whatever it is that I've been thinking about, and then wake up in the morning uh, at 6 a.m. tired and uh, struggling to get the dog over the park again. So (laughs) that's generally how it's... I I do have, you know, I'm... I've never been a particularly relaxed um, person, you know, I, in in the sense that I don't turn off particularly easy. You know, I'm, I'm not um, uh, easily kind of agitated. I think hopefully I, I'm fairly laid back, at least outwardly laid back in many ways. But I I don't switch off very easily, mm-hmm. um, and I don't say that as some kind of strange. Uh, a kind of inverted boast um, because I think it would be actually really useful to to be able to switch off much more easily. And uh, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just don't switch off very easily. And I've kind of always um, thinking of the the next thing I'm up to, and always need some kind of project on the go. Um, if you had to gift one book to the audience to say for Christmas, what would the book be, and why? So one of my favourite books is a book called um, Bounce by a UK journalist called Matthew Syed, who used to also be a um, one of Britain's uh, top table tennis players, okay. and now he's a sports journalist. Um, and Bounce is about, and, and other people have, I mean, it takes a lot of ideas from uh, other books, but it talks about uh, the, the myth of talent, essentially, uh, and talent versus practice, which has become a bit of a well-worn uh, topic now um, and essentially every time you mention this book it creates such a vociferous level of debate um, that it has created in itself many hours of kind of enjoyment and entertainment since I've read it um, many more than reading the book because people tend to have very strong views on it uh, about whether singing is natural uh, or about whether you know David Beckham's free kicks are talent or uh, practice, etc. So you can have a lot of debate on the back of it, but the book is generally about um, how uh, it, it goes with the ten thousand hours uh, theory. If you, if you do something for ten thousand hours, yeah, um, it has to be uh, structured practice for ten thousand hours. Then you can become, uh, you know, world class or, or an expert at least um, on things. Which I tend to generally go along with that line of thinking um i know there's a few caveats to it but i I generally am much more on the talent on the sorry on the practice side of things um and i don't really believe in natural talent for anything (laughs) well it sounds like a good book i'm gonna have to check this out after um last question for you best purchase under two hundred dollars Oh, I might have to think on that one. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, over two hundred dollars. Not that it's your question, but my um, uh, vacuum cleaner, which is Dyson vacuum cleaner, uh, is very sad and kind of shows my age. Ooh. But the um, handheld wireless uh, vacuum cleaner, yeah, um, the stick. I think they, they call it Dyson stick. Uh, has, has revolutionised uh, my life in a in a small way because all of a sudden, rather than being really um, really trying to avoid doing vacuuming, all of a sudden it becomes fun and easy because you can just pick up this uh, stick and whiz it around the house. So that's one of them. Well, that's quite a sad thing now. I actually mentioned it to you. But I, <laughs> I enjoy I've that been vacuum. I've been honestly considering getting one of those because we've got a very old vacuum cleaner here. Um, that was a hand-me-down from my partner's parents. Just, I don't know why we haven't bought a new one. It's one of those things, it's, you know, you don't use it that regularly. 
Um, but now it sounds like y- by getting that little stick that it, it makes it a bit of fun. Best best purchase under two hundred dollars would perhaps be my Kindle. Okay. If it was under two hundred dollars, I think it was under two hundred dollars. Yeah, it's about one eighty. Um, and I think now I think about it, actually, that would be one of my uh, best purchases um, because I get so much use out of it. Um, you do then become a slave to Amazon buying their Kindle books, but nonetheless, um, my wife takes a book everywhere she goes with them. I mean, everywhere. Um, partly because I always keep her waiting so she can fit in <laughs> another couple of paragraphs. And she's carrying around this uh, huge book of Michelle Obama at the moment um, and carrying it around with her everywhere. And as I pointed out to her the other day, uh, I had six books in my pocket um, because they were just all on my Kindle, which fits straight <laughs> in my pocket and didn't have to carry anything. So it sounds yeah, I, like do, I do I'm, like my Kindle. I'm like your wife. I, I don't know why, but I can't, I can't get myself there yet. Like I read a lot and I cannot get to the Kindle yet. It's just the idea of digitizing it for me. I just love... As someone who come f- came from a family of printers, the smell of paper and all that sort of stuff, I, I still, I don't know why. Maybe it's just a story I'm telling myself. <laughs> and one of the uh, nice things about Kindle in a way as well is you never quite know when the book's going to end because often the, because of indexes at the end, you don't know how how big the indexes are. So yeah. you, sometimes you can get to like 65% of the book and then all of a sudden you're on the last page and you finish. <laughs> so it can be a quite a nice surprise sometimes to finish books earlier than you thought. It's a good point. Uh, look, William, it's been fantastic having you in. I've enjoyed learning more about this freedom of information stuff. I've already started planning in my head things I'd like to look up, but um Thanks for coming in and I guess showing everyone what this is all about. Yep. Thank you. And where, just quickly, where can people find you? Where's the best place, you know, on the interwebs in some form? Is it the website or Twitter or? Yeah. So I run a blog, uh, williamsummers.blog. So pretty easy to remember that one. Um, And I put up stories on that. So it's not the kind of blog that I put up things daily. I put up, I try, I made a promise to myself when I started it that I was going to put up stories that were interesting rather than you know kind of photos of my lunch or just my no one really cares about my opinion on um you know kind of politics or who's saying what i want to put up news stories so for that reason something goes up every you know two or three weeks but i can promise you what goes up is good quality and it, it, often you read about it in the newspapers the next day as well <laughs> it is it, it is very very good and i think yeah your, your cadence is around every month so i think that's good enough for what we're getting it's good enough Thanks, mate. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for making it to the end. Before you run off, subscribe if you enjoyed this episode or do leave us a rating. For Instagram, go follow us on at uncommon underscore podcast. For YouTube, search uncommon podcast and don't forget to subscribe if you're watching this video. Also, give us a like or leave a comment on what you thought about the episode. But until next time, thanks so much for listening.